Um, I might as well, while I'm up here, just introduce everybody now. This is Andy Santiago, who gave us that fantastic reading. Hey, hi. Thank you. Thank you. Next to Andy is Natasha Sharp, author, DJ, and journalist, best known for lots of things, including the book Worldwide Gothic. Next to Natasha is Rosie Garland, singer, writer, performer. She's also Rosie Lugosi, the Vampire Queen, as well as author of the novel The Palace of Curiosities and Vixen. And, next to everybody, I feel like I'm the bloke of university challenge. <laughs> 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 he's a bass player, he's a vocalist from the Membranes, he's a journalist, he's a music writer, he's also in the band Goldblade, he's written loads and loads of books about music. I know that at the moment he's crowdfunding a book about goth. It's John Rock. And my name is David Quantic. Thank you for coming. Right, I've just set my watch, but I feel I should really be having a candle with black markings on the side to mark the passage of time. Um, thank you very much. Welcome to this event. It's tied in with the British Library's Gothic event, as you may have noticed from their short promotional trailer earlier, which was rather sweet. And we're going to be ranging over, obviously, the area of goth and its musical importance, and I'll be asking people a couple of questions. But one of the, uh, my short intro is it's always fascinated me the way that goth, as amongst all the so-called tribes, all the music genres of Britain, is the only one to come out of literature and poetry. Say what you like about mods, and I think they're wankers. Um, <laughs> mod, like a lot of things, came out of fashion and clothes. There is that element to, to the gothic subculture, but it's, it's unique to me. While other subcultures are about dressing up or about sex and dancing, the Gothic subculture, to me, it came out of things, it came out of an interest in death, it came out of an interest in, in the unknown, in darkness, and there really isn't anything like it, and I think for that reason, it should be celebrated. And I'm now going to ask, starting with Andy, who gave us that fantastic reading, and brilliantly tied everything in, to Dracula, to Bram Stoker, to the origins of Goth and Gothic, what, what sort of stirred your interest? How did you go from whatever you were doing when you were younger, to becoming a singer, to becoming a so-called goth? Um, I've always loved the arts. I first used to paint, uh, seriously. Um, then I was a political activist for some years. I was arrested several times for that, by the way. Um, and uh, I fell into music when I went on the run from the police, to be honest. Um, and I moved to Brixton, which was a safe haven then. And, um, but I'd always loved music. It, it was, as a medium, uh, music uh, overtook painting because it's multimedia, intense lyrics, music, uh, visuals, film, all the things I love. And um, I just fell into it, but I, I always had the desire to express through music as I felt it the ultimate medium. And uh, as for the style of musical, the things that one is drawn to, well, it's just something that's in your nature and your soul. You know, right. I've got black and white movies, Twenties, uh, thirties. Uh, of course, I love Bell and Gosey, like most people here. I've done when I was a child. You know, that sounds solid. I think probably well, most of you agree some element of that in your attraction. Well, what, what about you, Natasha? <laughs> For me, um, it's really difficult because God has always been there. I've yeah. never kind of, I've never been attracted to anything other than goth and gothic. So, I mean, from the first moment I saw Susie and the Banshees, which are probably on the old grey whistle test back in the late 70s, before they were even, you know, fully gothic, there was just something about them. And I, I, I was very young at the time, and I sat down with my mum and I said, but what, what on earth was I doing watching the old grey whistle test? What was I doing being attracted to this music? And, we, you know, we sat out and we tried to work it out. And the only thing I can think of is that my father was a really big horror movie fan. And I used to, you know, sneak downstairs in the middle of the night and <laughs> peep the head around the corner and she'd be watching Hammer Horror or, you know, sort of Ben Lugosi movies or Boris Karloff, you know, that kind of stuff. So I was drawn to that, probably because it was forbidden. I wasn't supposed to be watching it. He had loads of horror books. He was always reading, you know, literature like that. He loved Gothic novels. My mother was an artist and she was drawn to the macabre. And so I was brought up, kind of surrounded by that. My father also worked in the medical profession, so you know we had these sort of rather gruesome medical encyclopedias. Oh. So I think 
that, coupled with the visuals of Susan the Banshees, who, for me, they kind of always look like they'd fallen out of some sort of twisted fairy tale. And I think the songs are very simplistic, they're dark, but they're very simplistic and sing-songy and almost like sort of nursery rhymes or fairy tales, certainly early on. Well, literally, they would be nursery rhymes or fairy tales, yeah. And so I think just the whole thing, that's what attracted me. And then kind of as I went through life, people started saying, oh, you're a goth, am I? <laughs> you mean, hang on, there's actually a thing. I'm not doing something that is just unique to me. Other people like this stuff too. Wow, where are they? Take me to them. <laughs> you know, and, and eventually I, I met many of them and uh, you know, realized it was a thing. I mean, that's, that's I think is one of the great things about this. It is, it's a community. Would you say, Rosie, that when you became interested in music and literature and so on, that you found that all these strands came together into what is called goth? Um, I think it did. You know, Goth called and I answered, and I do think it came from, you know, it's that classic thing of looking back and thinking where on earth did that come from, and I guess for me it came from a profound sense from when I was little, because it wasn't, you know, the music movement wasn't around then, being quite ancient. Um, it came from a profound I thought you might sympathise. Yeah, I'm the oldest person in the entire place, probably. Um, uh, from a profound sense of feeling different. Um, and I didn't have words for that as a kid. Um, I knew that I was adopted and um, I knew that I didn't want to be pregnant by the age of 16. And, um, you know, although I didn't have the word queer when I was sort of like nine or ten, I certainly knew that I didn't fancy boys in the way that all my friends did. And, um, and I think all that kind of coalesced into a sense of being on the outside and not being on the inside, which kind of links into the goth thing. But I think when goth really first happened, um, I had an aunt who lived in the States, and people in the States have got a slightly different idea on what constitutes improving literature for children. And I think the Christmas of when I was eight or nine, she sent a collection of um, Edgar Allan Poe's Tales of Mystery and Imagination <laughs> as a Christmas present for me. And I can distinctly remember the first time I read um, The Pit and the Pendulum. And I didn't know that goth existed, I didn't know gothic literature existed, but I knew some deep chord in myself had been strummed. And it, that was the music, the, the mu for me the music came out of gothic literature. Yeah. And so I devoured a lot of that. Um, I was around when punk was happening, and so I. My mom, my mother refused to let me wear black because she said it was an old lady's colour. Oh, um, same thing here. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so yeah, and I used to really piss my mum off by saying, "If you'd let me wear black when I was a kid, I probably wouldn't wear so much now." Um, <laughs> lying, of course. Um, and I left home, moved north, best place in the world to live. Still live in the north. And it just happened that I was hanging around with a bunch of people in 1980-81 and the March Violets happened. I made a bit of a rubbish goth because I was a lesbian, there were no other lesbian goths. And I kind of made a really rubbish lesbian because lesbians didn't have long hair and wear leather. I know, I On the musical side of it, you were very well placed because for reasons which nobody can really put their, their finger on, Goth really sort of took off more in the north of England. It didn't, I, was, I was in Devon at the time, and there were no goths. There were <laughs> surfers, and I think surfers are the opposite of goths, in that you hope they might drown. But um, <laughs> yeah, you were there. I mean, basically because you come through punk rock and you were in the north of England, so you must have seen in the exhibition downstairs. There's a very strange article on the wall. It's, it's the headline is punk gothic, mm, and it's like, yeah, we talked about that before. Right? Yeah, it's, there is. There isn't such a thing as goth music at this point, so they're calling it punk. So, what was it like at that time? Well, for me, from my perspective, and I come more from a punk rock perspective, the punk was like the hammer that kind of smashed pop culture in the mid to late 70s. They never reconstituted the culture the way they wanted, so if you're into kind of darker things, you kind of reinvented all those little bits of the shrapnels left over in a darker kind of way. But already in, in punk, there, there was like Darker ends of it, one of the early Adam and the Ants, you know, mm -hmm. Dirty Wise White Socks, a record hated by the music press, but a genius record, mm -hmm. a template for a lot of stuff. What a massive fan base, I remember in a call. Yeah, yeah, he would just get a thousand people to a gig in London on, on, on ten band reviews, you know. Yeah. And I'd, I'd even argue the first three Strangers albums are a very important template, it's one of a very dark sounding band, dressing in black as well. 
Joy Division's in there as well. But the first time I ever heard the term goth was when Tony Wilson described Joy Division as a goth band, you know, and that was about really early on before they even, you know, but he just picked them up from factory. So there was a sense, that, there was no sense that it was a scene either, and I think, we go talk about this before, where the idea, there's two things here really, that in the UK, we invent all the best youth cultures in the world, and then we completely disown them and look a bit embarrassed about it, <laughs> while the rest of the world has a great time enjoying those youth yeah. cultures. But at the same time, nobody, you will never admit you're in the youth culture. I mean, I would never admit I was a punk, and I was interested in goth music, but there's no way I'd ever say I was a goth. I mean, why would no, no, I don't think anyone in this room would consider themselves a thing. You, 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 is that idea, is, I know everyone says the individual you're the same, but it's, people like the look, and they like that kind of music. So it's a, it's a very disparate scene of people doing very different things in different places at the same time. And for me, the, the kind of one it went overground, in a sense, to me, was the Future Armour at D-Side Leisure Centre. Was that 1980 or I can't remember now, it was the year was. Yeah, and I know people have been doing stuff before, but that seems to be the first weekend where everybody seems to meet everyone else. Some Death Court played it, the Dan played it. There's like a lot of bands, and it was just one of those moments where everyone went, wow, where's all these people come from that are into it? And it was, it was a continuation of punk, which, it was a freaky end of punk, which is interesting. One of the things that's interesting about punk, and it was, it was and glam was a big influence as well, and goth as well. It's all, it's all about, the thing about glam was, it was people dressing up on top of the pops, and it was unattainable, you couldn't do it, and it was like David Bowie came from Mars, he didn't come, and, and Mark Bowen came from London, and to us in Blackpool, London couldn't as well be Mars, it was like a million miles away. <laughs> but the great thing about punk and goth was, it was dressing up in the suburbs, and, and not, the not so great thing was getting beaten up and dressing up in the suburbs, but it, you were dressing up like the, the freaks you'd grown up with dressing up, and it was your turn, and you put your own street doing it. And that, that was that was strength in it, and you got people to dress up and do freaky things, and it created a space for that to happen as well. And for me, that's a punk created the, the energy to do that, so, and got reinterpreted in its own kind of way. Now, as an endless argument to define what exactly goth is, and everyone in this room will have their own interpretation of it. So, if I, if I gave you what my interpretation of it, but everyone go, oh no, 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 no. But to me, it's more. There's, there's, there's obviously kind of classic goth groups, you know, like The Cure or whatever, The Early Cure. Pornography is still one of my favourite records. It's a fantastic record, a really dark record. Um, I mean, Joy Division is one of you know, they're never ostensibly a proper goth bands, but the music super dark, futuristic, never dates. But I also like some of the more you know, we talked about before as well, like, uh, I think Ash Dizem and Oibart, in a sense, are an absolute classic goth band, even though Blix and Bargell will probably get in a, have a fight over you about that, you know. But the way he looked and the, what they sound like, and it's, to me, it's, it's a very art, like you said a minute ago, about literature and stuff like that. It's an art movement. And, and this cliche idea, and it's great all the stuff about the vampires now, because Evans attracts to the dark and he's sexy the dark side. But it's also a, a proper art movement as well. The way that we'll come on to, we'll yeah. come on to that in a second draw. Yeah. Want it, talking about the musical side of it, I mean, you're right, I was around. I think there isn't a single person on this table who's under 17, if I'm honest. Um, <laughs> and with all due respect. And, <laughs> One of the strange, I mean, I do remember at the end of the punk, suddenly you'd see people wearing long flowing clothes, black clothes by and large, you'd see back combing. And it was kind of, it's interesting because after punk, things fracturing. You had these people on the King's Road with the, the peacock punk, and that was obviously sort of died off. You had two tone coming along. You had the new romantics, you had people dressing up as Mexican barmen, uh, that sort of thing. <laughs> which was kind of nice, and it was really interesting that. Also, the sound, I mean, you started basically becoming a musician and singer around this time. The sound of goth doesn't have a lot of bongos on it, a lot of trumpets on it. No, it I would say it was also pretty minimal. Um, and I was starting to add, talking, going back to Don't Put My Socks, mm. so glad you brought that up, Richard. That album, perhaps the most seminal, seminal album, for me is as important, if not more so, than The Beatles' Sergeant Pepper. I think The Beatles are a great band. Deserved their reputation. It doesn't matter. It, it, it's just a. Uh, I'm scared. Why are you doing it? Fair enough. <laughs> but I mean, Dirt Was My Socks, we wrote the new book. And it's like, fuck yeah. When I say that, fuck. I'm like, sorry. Um, you know, we wrote the new book. Just any thoughts? I can do this. Like, yeah. I, I couldn't stand those freaking cliches, you know, in music. And this was different. Um, it was just coming from nowhere. It didn't sound like um, anything else at the time. It wasn't trying to fit into a market, and for not just myself, but for so many others, that was just like, yes, let's do something that doesn't fit anywhere. Right. Let's express ourselves freely. You know, I just come from doing a lot of extreme weird shit, you know, in my musical days, and so 
I was about to uh, bend over and make music that I thought the red covers would like. It was like that, you know. Mm. I wanted to destroy all of that. Which was just as well because they wouldn't take any notice of us anyway. Um, it's, it's, I mean, there is a way of doing that, but yeah. I did do I'll well, talk about it often. I think that, was one of the, that was one of the really exciting things about the 80s, which feels like we're kind of coming around to it again, was that we knew that the record company was never going to press our records. So we, yeah, we were with the sisters with Merciful Release for a while, but it was this idea of like, if you haven't got a record label, start your own. Contact some people who will press up seven inches design your own seven inch covers and do it yourself. Maybe if you can get like, you know. Yeah, yeah. That, that was a very important start to get up on because what it yeah. that space to, to independent actually labels. To independent labels. Yeah. 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 With, yeah. Without being too rude, it's like NME for example weren't terribly nice. <laughs> they weren't terribly oh, nice. We're not gonna pick I, on them. No, 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 we're not going <laughs> <laughs> to pick on them. But, but, um, but and a lot of the them. music <laughs> press, the most unfashionable music press, like we sneered. To be honest, I think that's one of the reasons that Goth has survived because it's never been taken by success. It's never been fashionable. <laughs> yes. might, I think it was in the week in nineteen eighty three, I might go to the back cave because it had been in the face. It seems extraordinary now. You read about it in the face and you go down there and think, oh, this is quite good, and then you wouldn't go back. But um <laughs> See, that's when the rest of us stopped going. Right, because it's been too <laughs> It was too I wanted to be club in the beginning. Um, the only thing I have at the back end is um, for some reason a lot of bands seem to have that association. Uh, Seth Gantt would be one of them, unfortunately. Made from foreign press and uh, there was no association except the fact that we reg regularly visited the place because it made good music. We see, it it seemed a very different thing than the North as well. Mm. No, the, the back end was a very different scene, felt different. Well, it, I mean, it, it does the same. Yeah. You know, it did come out. There were these, there was this club, Gossips, in Dean Street, mm, great and great. the thing about Gossips was that it hosted. Mm. You know, I used to go to a Johnny Thunder style night. There would, you know, there would be the Modern Romance nights. There would be so many different kinds of nights there, and the Back Cave really was just another night. But because Goths looked great, because it had not been seen before, you know, they were always in in the style press. You know, because it was a great photo, and I think that was a difference. Whereas people like Johnny Thunder couldn't really stand up. They still look great. Yeah, so they still look great. Yeah, they look yeah. great, but they but they couldn't stand up. Yeah. Um, I think that's one of the differences between the north and south is that you've got in the north that got is taken on post-punk, it's yeah. taken very seriously. Whereas in the south, the back cave was very tongue-in-cheek. It was humorous. It oh, was yeah. like, you know, hey, let's have a great time. It was more serious because you get the, you could get yeah. beat up, fucking yeah. yeah. slightly different to all those towns. One, one of the interesting things about Goth is how some of the bands, and I don't mean the epicenters of it, came from really unlikely places. And like Keithley. Yeah, <laughs> they weren't bizarre places. So yeah. It's come out, you know, for yeah. something like that. And, uh, and, uh, and I just the towns or bars or something like that, you know, that's, and that's the place it came out of, it's, it's people very committed to doing something in a quite dangerous kind of backdrop at the same time. Yeah. So there is, I think there's quite a difference between the North and the South, so you didn't know, they do link together, and there's no sense of rivalry between them, but I think it's just, it, they came out of different kind of, I think the London scene a lot they came out of New Romantic as well, didn't it, and that little mixture of things that go on after punk. And there's some of the art school stuff as well, mm. that you, you could, you know, go to art school and look flamboyant nobody was going to beat you up, so it was a safe environment, and then you could then take that onto the club, um, you know, pre-back haven with the Blitz. Try to go back and reach them, where I used to live. Yeah. <laughs> well, even that. Yeah, 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 so that's, so that's important to make a distinction, but the good thing is important to talk about, again, it's a sense, is the music press maybe weren't covering it, but the fanzine was really important, like Mick versus Panache, it's a great fanzine, and Tom made Vague, which to me is the best fanzine he ever made, it's brilliantly written, and it's brilliantly laid out, and it looked really fantastic, and it's a shame that guy never actually got into the media, the media really, because he's a really great writer, wasn't he? Mm -hmm. and, uh, so the actual people writing Grim Humour, that's a really great fanzine. So and there's a things and apology, yeah. which was a good one. So it had its own... Um, Media and, and, and they were actually really good fans, some of the best fans this country's ever produced. And I think again, this has contributed to the longevity of, of Goth because a lot of things, you know, something like Mob very quickly became very, very commercial. You know, like you could be a nine year old boy, you could buy a plastic tie and a little pork pie hat and see your bands on top of the pops. 
whereas to be a nine year old goth would be a lot more difficult and Tony we won't, we'll go into sort of the emo thing maybe later but I mean what was it so you start off you like what becomes called goth you read certain books you dress a certain way when did you realise that you weren't alone so I'm going to happen no, don't stop. You can be alone with silly. I've always been alone. It's nothing wrong with being alone. Um, different from being lonely. Um, going back to what John said earlier, um, very good point. And I, I too, I used to wear bondage pants, you know, when I was going to these demonstrations, but without straps, because you can't. <laughs> bite it, you know, with um, bondage straps, take them off. But the thing is, you know, but I never considered myself or called myself a punk. Um, and I still to this day would not consider myself as a god. I'm just me, I'm an individual, as we all are. I just like certain things and express. Everything about you must be an expression. Down to your the tips of your toes, to your haircut, whatever, however you want it. But I mean, it doesn't alter who you are inside. Um, your question again. Um, <laughs> I knew many people. I had skin into a friend, you know. Um, I had a. Uh, these people, I, I didn't stick within one certain group. I had, you know, I had a mixture of people. What did they always say? Before? Except hippies. Was there hippies in the golf clubs in the north? It's quite absurd to talk about hippies because they're like the hippies of the chemical, proper chemical culture. Yeah. Because when we talked about this before, it's probably wasn't less of a scene that a loose confederation of people who took roughly the same type of stuff in a very different way. So that's how it started off. But I guess a lot of music scenes start like that, don't they? Then they become very formulised. And then people start saying, but you're not doing the right things to be this thing, that's when it gets really ridiculous. And it's one of those internal arguments, and it's like, what's a punk, what isn't a punk, what's a goth, what isn't a goth. Because it becomes restricted. And the dead arguments, yeah, aren't they? That kills the whole yeah. feeling point of it, you know? Yeah, yeah. You must express exactly how you want. Don't go and get a ready made, you know, pack of things, I must only wear this, I must only like that. It's a mishmash, you know? That's how, that's how movements start. You know, before. The, the one year before he gets done, we'll try to destroy them, yeah. or do whatever. But then it becomes a carbon copy, which is actually why, for me, starting that music, one of my missions, one of the missions, the agendas was to destroy Oi Punk, which I thought was... You did it. I love <laughs> Sex Pistols, absolutely, with a vengeance, but um, when I, Oi Punk, I just thought killed the whole memory of well, that was more the media, the media killed it because it's... Yeah, the media killed it because... Some of that was what it was about. Was that the time we were from on the world from a discussion about oi punk now. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> when you talk about sort of uh, things being put into a box, almost when goth became goth, then when it got its name, mm. that's sort of when it started to go, all oh, right, goth, right, that's like gothic, so that means that you must dress in a certain way, right. you must read a certain type of literature, almost at that point. Right. And, you know, later on, some of many of us have tried to break away and said, well, you don't have to be categorised. I mean, um, for many years, Whitby Gothic Weekend, the big festival up in, in um, Whitby in North Yorkshire, the local paper, the Whitby Gazette, would write about the black-clad hordes would descend <laughs> upon Whitby. And then they suddenly twigged, well, hang on a minute, there's such a thing called cyber goth. Well, we can't call them black-clad hordes. So it was... The many colours, <laughs> you know, it, 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 no, yeah, exactly. No longer fitted into a little, a little box. You can say all the gods wear black because that wasn't true. Yeah, so the, the wider picture is a lot bigger thing. Mm. I was hoping you would say some more words. <laughs> 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 you just think how profound you were there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a T-shirt. I actually think art house. The term art house, which uh, I first heard that when I was a conversation with. Ian Asprey, the singer, and he was living with me, and uh, not in the biblical sense. And uh, <laughs> he, we were talking about, he was playing the press, trying to hang the G word on this movement, this post punk movement that happened. And um, everyone was trying not to have the G word passed over to them um, because we didn't want the tabloids <coughs> to create a, and kill the expression the possibility for individualism, which is the key factor in any form of expression in any movement. And um, 
you know, as we just said, we were talking about some of these bands that said, they're just great art house bands. They don't need to be, you know, and I totally agree. But that becomes another cliche. So, but yeah, it doesn't matter. Well, this was when it's, it's just a shorthand, and it? it's just it's just an easy yeah. way. You know, I mean, yeah. nowadays I think, well, okay, you know, it's like a categories are going to come anyway. So mm. they, you know, as long as everybody in the category realizes it's not a category. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it's good yeah. Yeah. and it doesn't become a yeah. yeah, this is like now goth feels like an umbrella term. Certainly mm. in Germany, you have the trance scene, the dark scene, and it's you know even bigger. You get the, the gothic metal, you get I, the medieval styles, things that you wouldn't necessarily associate with goth if you didn't actually yeah. you know, know that much about it. But that's the thing I always have to share. Culture feels fractions more than well, micro culture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a long way, it's been gone for Yeah, I, I suppose that um, I, I think that's one of the keys, many keys to sort of the fact that this is the scene that wouldn't die. I mean, I have to admit, I, I think that's a kind of interesting strap line, the scene that wouldn't die, because it, for me it does seem to suggest that maybe it ought to. Um, <laughs> yeah, I see. Well, it, it, and it seems to, and for me that links directly into that the person who wrote that strap line, the scene that wouldn't die, isn't somebody who call themselves a goth. Um, and I, I, I am very interested in the way that, you know, God does keep re reiterating and reinventing itself. And I think you're right about the fact that it's long past has got a lot to do with that. Um, but I am fascinated by how much goth is a dirty word. Yeah. And so many people trip over themselves to say, I'm not a goth, but... In a similar way that, like, the word feminist or the word queer is a dirty word, although queers are very, very good at reclaiming their insults, I'm very pleased to say. And it would be nice if goths were wanting to like reclaim it a bit more as well. And I can see why some people don't want to be called goth, no names, no pat drill, um, because maybe it's felt like it's restrictive. But I do think it's, it, it is really interesting that there is this huge sneering, um, which I'm fascinated by because um, the Renaissance, when the Renaissance came in, there was a massive sneering culture against the, the medieval Gothic. It's fascinating. So it's historical. Oh, historical yeah. sneering. Can't blame no, 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 no. You can't actually blame him, which is why I think he's so lovely. Um, and then when you, the when you look at um, <laughs> <laughs> when you look at uh, mainstream yeah. literary culture's reaction to Gothic literature, um, Coleridge in particular described Gothic literature as the trash of the circulating library. So it was trash and also, God damn it, it was popular yeah. and people enjoyed it. And I think this whole sneering, I think is one of the things why Goths find it difficult to say, Mummy, Daddy, I've got something important to tell you, I'm a Goth. And it's like, I'm sorry, I printed this, this picture out, it's from, um, Tank Girl, The Odyssey, page 11 of issue 3, which actually I got from the British Library site because they own the original. And it's a brilliant, brilliant drawing by Jamie Hewlett of um, goths attacking a bunch of people, which I think is interesting considering the radio play we've just had. And it's the only time in the whole of Jamie Hewlett's comic creation where he writes a comment underneath the picture in which he addresses the reader, it's not the writer, it's not part of the story, and it says here, the fact that I've paid absolutely no attention to what goths wear is an even bigger insult to them and their turdy culture. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jenny. <laughs> and so, and we're, well, yeah, exactly, very, very fashionable and probably buying a new Ferrari every year. <laughs> but I'm not bitter. Well, Rosie, all, all the best culture is a country that's not accepted by the mainstream. This, I know. Yeah, it's, it's better to be on the outside. Once you're on the inside, it's boring. But it's this idea of, like, outside suggests that there is a mainstream inside to want to be in. And that's only a point of view. My attitude, and um, maybe it comes from being around queer culture a lot, is that, like, I'm not outside. I'm just different and I'm really proud of that. I'm not outside the main who wants to be in mainstream culture. I'm not interested in Adidas t shirts. Keep them. It's all a lie. Mainstream culture is a complete lie. We've talked, I think John and people talked about sort of the way that tribes, I mean it's a bit of a cliche, but you know, when I was a kid everyone was in a tribe. If you weren't in a tribe, they put you in a tribe. You know, what are you? I don't know, right? You like heavy metal, oh do I? That sort of thing. And 
It is a bit depressing now when you walk down the street in any town and everyone seems to be wearing hooded tops with the names of shoes on the back. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's actually not true. Yeah, it is where I live. No, <laughs> that's, that's not true at all. You go to most towns on a Saturday afternoon and there's loads of kids into walk and metal walk around those towns. And those, it's not just a mass of kids who are just into metal, they subdivide and open up mini genres. So you just briefly mentioned emo there, which is kind of people dressing up in black clothes making music virtual boy band music but mm. it's, a, it's a still a huge try so and now think about when I was a kid at school and there's only about three punks in the whole school so you, you know you see a documentary or a film that's going to make about 1977 that everybody's a punk it wasn't like that at all mm. was it? most people were walking around with tops and they wouldn't have had names of shoes on the back of they couldn't work out how to put the name of the shoe on the back <laughs> of the time so it wasn't like there was ever a golden period of culture where everybody's into really cool stuff all at once because there's many well, it's true. there's probably more people now into outside of so called outside of culture, different culture than there was when I was 18 so I think it's, a, I think it's one of those things when you're older you can't tell differences between what, what the young people are into. They all look the same to me. Well, yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> you live in Hastings anyway, so. We, we yeah. talk, we, I mean, we are here to talk about the musical yeah. side of things. I'm just going to do my favourite line that I thought of, which is that all these bands, and we, we don't have to name names, but you know, Susan the Banshees, and Nick Cave, The Cure being the big three, all these bands who, don't, who say that they're not goths, what I like is the fact that you don't get to choose. It's the, pe it's the people mm -hmm. who like your music. Choose. I've always said that. I've said that when people talk about it. <coughs> when people say, you know when Johnny Rotten will say, yeah. they, they weren't punks, that's not a punk band, whatever. You give it up to you. Yeah. It's up to the audience. The audience dictates what the culture is, and I think that's the biggest strength of it. When it comes down to the media, and we're just going to talk me and you out of job really, David, it's not really up to us, is it? It's up to the people who actually buy the stuff and go to the gigs and are involved in the culture. Uh, Totally more the culture, they decide who's in and who's out. It's not up to Nick Cave's side whether it's a goth or not. In fact, it'd be quite funny if we went back in time and said, He's not a goth, and no goth, I'm going to buy his records. He wouldn't actually have a career at all. Would he? No, I mean, you go back and look, look, he did have a career because he's made like, endlessly great records, hasn't he? Well, he's got a haircut, he looks a bit smarter nowadays. <laughs> yeah, all those videos when he was a kid, if he's not a goth, I don't know what he is. He's certainly not a mob. He wears the black cave, didn't he? I don't give a tiniest rat's crap if the March Violets or me or anyone else is called God. I'm far more interested in, well, but did you like the lyrics? Did you like the music? Do you want to come to a gig? It's what's like, it like if I can ask the, musician, the goth musicians here, what's it like to play that, play that kind of music, to play music that means a lot to you, and then discover that, you know, again, this thing that you are not alone? The people want to come, it strikes, I hate this phrase, strikes a chord with people. Mm -hmm. um, well, if it wasn't for, if it wasn't for people who want to buy the records, CDs, digital downloads or whatever, and turn up to gigs, we'd be standing on an empty stage performing to nobody. So personally, I think if it strikes a chord and people are into it, eh, it's a no-brainer. It's like, thank you very much. And it's like particularly, if, you know, if it's a scene that creates its own press, like I really like what you said about the fan scenes, mm -hmm. is it doesn't matter if the London-based presses go, oh, this isn't cool, and anyway, Jamie Hewlett hates it. It's like, you know, if people mm -hmm. are turning up and going, well, sod them, I've made my own mind up about what I want to listen to, mm -hmm. then great. So that's the really accelerated the internet now, because we can make our own minds yeah. about things, because they can hear things and see things, and it doesn't get filtered by the so-called gatekeepers. Yeah. 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 We always knew that the enemy secretly that people weren't buying it for our brilliant articles. And <laughs> what time gigs started? Yeah, it's the same sound as we did. We did a survey, we found out that 80% of the readers bought it for the gig guys. Yeah. And I think that's a really important thing to remember when you're a music writer. Oh, God, we used to get upset when they took our names off the cover. We probably sold more issues when they took our names off the cover. But yeah, I mean, we talked about the music, obviously, because that's why we're here for. But if you were building a goth, if you'd been commissioned by a major corporation <laughs> to build a goth, what would you put, what would you expect them to want, and what do you think? What's part of goth that people don't think is goth? Does that make any sense? Because there is the cliche, which we're not really here to talk about the cliche of goth. So what is? What's the essence of it? If there was a goth suit, what would be in it? <laughs> not literally a suit. But <laughs> <laughs> this is really stretching out, isn't it? I think. I think <laughs> Be in it. I think, I mean, you know, people say, I get asked a million and one times, you know, what is goth? And it's like, 
So I say, well, goth is a dark aesthetic. You know, it's I, I look at things through a gothic lens. I, it's very difficult for me to say, well, blah blah blah. This is me, because I'm me, and why would I dissect what I am and who I am? Um, so I think you know, things that aren't goth, um, walking around with a hoodie with shoes, shoes leather shoes on the back, that that wouldn't be goth. Um, I suppose unless you were to help with it. Oh yeah, sorry. I love this. A trend forecaster. Yes. I've had a new phrase that a trend forecaster told us that the new thing coming on now is health gone. We've <laughs> <laughs> been going to the gym with just black t shirts and black leggings and black trainers for years. That's <laughs> health gone. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and and that's Adidas not. are at the forefront of it. <laughs> <laughs> just so you know, you heard it here first. We can all be health gone. Yes, <laughs> yes. Yeah. But as far as I'm concerned, that ain't gone. <laughs> Um, I would also say that rap music is a goth. Although oh, no, the, the trend well, 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 said that Kanye West is a goth because he's wearing a black leather kilt. <laughs> That's true. This is pretty dark rap music. Yeah, yeah. I think mean, it's gothic. Well, you, the word you, two words you said before was mm. quite interesting with dark aesthetic, which, mm. I, which I would actually say. It's actually pretty bad term for the whole thing in goth anyway. It's weird. It's named after a tribe that sat Rome. Yeah. 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 Rome. I'd like to point yeah. out that the Romans sneered at Alaric and his mates. <laughs> <laughs> and look what happened to them. <laughs> <laughs> History repeats itself many, many times. But dark aesthetic is, yeah. I would say, is. Um, it's what you put in your soup, David. The dark is dark aesthetic. Yeah, yeah, because then you can have your literature, you can have films, you can. If, I mean, there are many goths out there that aren't actually into gothic literature and don't like horror films. You know, who are just they call themselves goths or they're into goth because of the post-punk connection, mm -hmm. and maybe they some of them have political leanings. Last week when I did my book launch here, um, some people asked me, you know, what were the politics of goth? Well, contemporary goth doesn't really have politics mm. back in the post-punk years. Absolutely. Mm. Is that true, Andy? Is mm. there a political side to Johnson in the early years? UK to K, absolutely. Killing joke? Yeah. Why not have that as an ingredient? And I would say, um, it just depends. Whenever you do a knife, then, okay, so now we're talking about what is the culture, but <coughs> the most important thing is to say, be yourself, you know? Mm. Be true to what you feel inside. Surely that's why you're attracted to a mm. look and aesthetic in the first place, way of thinking. Um, so individuality should go in the goth soup. Absolutely, but there's something also you cannot put your finger on. Mm. Which is why I say the dark aesthetic, right. because it's sort of like this kind of mass, yeah, bubbling goo. But literally, <laughs> oh, I can just see it. It's good. It's good. It's good. It's good. It's I think there's a thing in an, in an off game, right? I'm going to talk about Spectre North because that's where I came from. But every northern town on a Monday night would have a club you could go to, which was safe to go to, and that would be the goth club. So that would be the punks, I think, because all three to go to this club. They would generally play goth music because they'd be the kind of people more organised and get things together. But the happened from the music they would play would be slightly wider than what people think is goth music now. So, so again, this soup's got a lot of different ingredients in it, so you can go to some quite different places. Orange peel. I've done that, it's good, trust me. It was the one, one call. Was, yeah. Yeah, well, it, it was actually the biker pub. But, you know, the goths went there, the, sorry, hippies went there, the bikers went there, the punks went there, everybody went there. And they it's played the gothic music because everybody liked it's it. It's a continuation of the Bowie Roxy thing before punk. The, but the Bowie Roxy clubs had only one in each city, but there wouldn't be in towns because it was too mm. weird to get to towns. So by the time we got to about 80, 81, so every town would have a little scene, but it would be about 50 people. So I put that in the soup. But it's an interesting soup in a big pot for this soup. Ultra. <laughs> 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 What's always very interesting to me is, is the early days of the, the early days of the scene when things haven't coalesced. That you know now, if you were working for a music paper, if there were any, and you did a top ten goth <laughs> record, it would take you about five seconds. But and, and you'd get a load of complaints about why didn't you include this? Why didn't you include that? Isn't goth? <laughs> that's this goth. That's, that shows the scene is still alive when everyone's yeah. arguing about what. It, not well, it, it's like the BBC's yeah. recent the um, goth at the BBC, which yeah. you know, I think the sister is a weird choice. Yeah, Shakespeare's sister and PJ Harvey. 
修行しようかしいのノーノーディスティーあなたがいてもポンクシーのレジュリーはいや、コネクティーです。ウェイブライト。そこはミュージカル、そこはミュージカル。そこはミュージカル。そこはミュージカル。そこはミュージカル。そこはミュージカル。そこはミュージカル。そこはミュージカル。そこはミュージカル。そこはミュージカル。そこはミュージカル。そこはミュージカル。そこはミュージカル。そこはミュージカル。そこはミュージカル。そこはミュージカル。そこはミュージカル。It's the music, I, I, when I, the argument I have, the reason I was going to do a book, is Sam Reynolds did that fantastic book about Hocus Pocus, which it dismisses goth music in one paragraph, saying, a kid and joke about Bauhaus, I never really understood those groups. And that's it, they're gone. But to me, when I listen to Bauhaus now, they're incredibly revolutionary down musically. That was like, that was like anything that ever went before. They were doing like, Dark dub records. I mean, what a weird, weird thing to come up with. Daniel Ashley, one of the greatest guitar players ever came out of this country, he never plays anything as dull as a riff. Or a boring guitar solo, he makes weird little noises. He's a really interesting avant garde guitar player, but totally hated by the music press. And when you see people doing, you know, talk about the early 80s music, they're never mentioned, are they? Or, or, or just sneered at or something, but incredibly influential bands. And, and, and worldwide terms, probably, probably the most influential of all the bands we're talking about, because the, the influence down in America is, is enormous, isn't it? But we don't get the credit for it, and that starts to really annoy me. So that's the reason I was going to do my book, it's the other half. Or the post punk thing, because in a sense, I always think, when I think of God, I actually think of it as post punk, really. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it is, I mean, that's literally what it is post punk, because at the time, then we had a sense of post punk, because in 1978, you were going, right, we're all this post punk now, yeah. because it's, it was just another version of punk, wasn't it? Some of the death calls was, and incredible musical bands, you know, they, they were doing stuff, probably out from the ants as well, you could hear a bit of the ants in there, but they took it somewhere else, didn't they? It was really original. But, it, but the loose thing to join the band together musically is the bass guitar is very important because that's the instrument everyone could learn very easily in punk, people write songs and it. it's very melodic in a lot of so-called golf bands. Guitar players do kind of weird little noises on top, a lot of tribal drumming, a lot of kind of great yodeling singing and you were kind of doing that as well, weren't you? Well, I think the thing for us is that, um, and I was that we felt that we were like at the forefront of brand new technology. Guitar's bass, mm -hmm. fine, but it, it's like I know it's really ridiculous to think of the drum machines that were around at the time, mm -hmm. but we were determined not to have a drummer right from the start. And it was absolutely where the new technology was happening. So I think that's another thing mm -hmm. that felt important about the music, was trying out new things. Right. So and newness. Yes, though, and bizarrely, whenever, you know, because a lot of it is about golf going about the past, but and, and obviously, March Fowlers didn't call themselves golf at the start because we were there before the Labour Union. Um, mm -hmm. But it was a case of like, brilliant, do you mean we can go to a gig on the bus <laughs> because the drums are like that big? <laughs> How fantastic! And so it, it, and it was just that excitement of like, well, what happens if you go like that? Ooh. And it was that real excitement of working with new stuff. Mm -hmm. And I guess that's. Something that we still enjoy doing. The reason about drum machines is, and I'm guessing, do you use the 606? What we're oh, using? Yeah. yeah. That, that drum machine doesn't date, it sounds it's modern not, now. Actually, yeah. we bought, because obviously. In, but the more modern drum machines, <laughs> so, so, yeah, so, we um, lost the 606, or I don't know, somebody patched at it. And we actually bought one on eBay. Oh, did and you? Yeah. It's like, oh my god, it sounds the same. So, yes, yeah, it's fantastic. It's a great, it's a great drum machine. I know we're getting a little techie here. Can we get the 606 into the box soon? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, the yeah. And Steve R.B. used one in Big Black because yeah. he likes Sister Mercy, which is one of those things that people never mention either because, it, because Steve's brilliant, the music he's done is brilliant, his aesthetics really brilliant, but he's a massive Sister Mercy fan, but you know, that doesn't ever seem to get mentioned because you're not allowed to mix that a goth band can actually be so called goth band. Is meant to be. It could be influential, so he's meant yeah. to work, you know. So, so that's the reason you have the drum machine and the, the, the 606 yeah. totally rule. So let's put that in the soup. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, the other thing is, like, a lot of golf really does go back to Susie and the Banshees, and even since Joy Division. And it is that, those circular bass lines that Steve Severin played, probably because he couldn't play the bass very well. So he sort of go there and come, I can't play the bass, you can tell by his fingers. <laughs> but he sort of go there and think, oh, I can't go any further, I'll come back again. <laughs> and that, that translates into Peter Hook's slightly more skill based playing and you hear a lot of that on early golf. I just thought that was what a great way to approach a song, not from the guitar from the bass. Bass yeah. is my first art. First instrument I learned to play when I was at school and um, I just always loved the bass, so you put the dog there and records had old bass mm -hmm. dub DJs, you know. And um, you know they hook 
and sermon, um, especially hooky. Uh, what a great way to approach a song, you know, you play like a guitar, you riff. Who, who had done that on the bass before? You know, it's great. Um, it gives you a different perspective on the song. Um, space yeah. with a great yes. space. Yes. Like it, it just gives you a different perspective. It, it totally then opens up things for the drums. Um, then all of a sudden the drums will totally change, and you know, uh, then the guitar part is reinvented and rethought because so the guitarist has to approach uh, uh, not from a normal stance. Mm -hmm. Great, you know, that, that, that way you can investigate new territories. But I think it's a lot of factors. Yeah. Like, what might like happen, Andy? I think, I think in <coughs> like I said a minute ago, because it's easy to to learn. So within a week, anyone can play a bass. So well, I on it. Less, yeah. And I think also, because, because stranglers again, because you never heard a bass that loud before, that was important, great style. And Jar Robber as well in Rock and Pill. Genius. Yeah. And then, because there was this double reggae, and because John Peel was so fantastic, played such a wide cross section music, I think the late 70s was a time when the bass guitar got reinvented, it became a lead instrument. Mm -hmm. I think that really coalesces around that time of the, of the uh, so called goth bands. So we'll have to put bass guitar in the soup as well, won't we? Yeah. <laughs> and also, of course, with the. It's like to regret mentioning the soup now. Oh, I've got a record running with this, it's good. Yeah. Also, another thing about the, the, the time of guitar on the bass is it, it's a reaction. In some extent, against you know the crashing guitar of punk, just that relentless "I can't hear you, mum," <laughs> which is great in its own way. Great in its own way, but after yeah. five years of it, it's <laughs> like, <laughs> 1977 was the longest year in the history of the world. It's still going on if you go to BBC Four. You still see John and me in wheelchairs. You know, <laughs> see him take that or whatever it was. Yeah. But but then you say that you see about the, the noisy guitars of punk, but then you've got certain strands of goth, mm. death rock, who are bringing back those kind of punky guitars and, and the horror punk, which, if we're talking about the German dark scene, they, you know, horror punk fits under that goth punk rock. Well, with all the Germans, I spent <laughs> half my time in Berlin. They, it's very blinkered, whereas, for example, if you go to Italy, because there you'll see people are more glamorous, but they're more, there's more individuality in their approach um, to the way they dress, also to the music they like, um, and to the music they're open to. Uh, in Germany it tends to be very, very blinkered. Not all of them. Neubaden, mm. well put as well. Great art house band. And well, they, they can really turn the thing upside down. Absolutely brilliant. You listen um, to one of their records, it's got like a hundred ideas. Big, big 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 and their new albums of Work of Genius, it's absolutely fantastic. Yeah, when you watch those guys at work in the studio, they, yeah. it, it's like watching artists paint. Yeah. yeah, I wanted to move on. Um, no, I didn't want to move on because again, um, I wanted to think, we've talked about pretty much every aspect of the classic goth record, except the one that is, I hate Marmite. I mean, I literally hate Marmite, but I also hate that comparison of you either love because I just think I don't love it or hate it. it just That's not going to sea. It's not going to the sea, right. Right. no. no. Um, but one, if we're using the Marmite love it or hate it comparison, one thing is the goth vocal, because some people. It's not, you know, it's not Annie Lennox, is it? By and large, you know, there are brilliant singers who are associated with goth, and there are also um, dramatic singers. Oh. <laughs> what is a goth vocal? What is a goth yeah, vocal? Exactly. Is, is it, it am I too far from the mic? Not now, I. Am I? You should be. You're a singer. Yeah, you're a singer. You're a singer. There you go. What is a goth vocal? What is a goth vocal? The latest. And the pretty most cliche way, it's kind of a croony thing, and it goes back to Jim Morris to the Doors kind of thing, that sonorous, deep, uh, kind of croon, the deep voice thing. And that's, it's a cliche idea, but we, we should mention the Doors in here as well. Yeah. yeah. You are like a walking encyclopedia. I am really impressed. <laughs> <laughs> you know your own, yeah. sir. <laughs> The door is the first golf fashion talk. <laughs> in a sense, but it, it kind of goes back about, but, but a lot of this setting will come round. We'll start with Jim Morrison in a way, won't it? The, the poetic thing, the rich thing you talked about before, you know, this is a guy I can remember. His party trick was he would get people to read the beginning of a book out and he'd know which book it was, and he just wrote in those books. I don't even know where he got the time to read those books because I'm sure he was drunk all the time. <laughs> but so is that the way he looked, the way he dressed, and the way he acted, the way he sang? It's quite an important influence on golf. And interesting enough, Apocalypse Now, the film came out that time, and that was an influence on people as well. And the doors beyond that soundtrack put them back into the, the underground of the mainstream, didn't it? 
I remember in, in Vague Fanzine, you used to do lots of different pop-ups now, didn't they? But great little cartoons stuff about and things like that. So that was part and parcel of it as well, wasn't it? Yeah, that, I mean, that was a change in the times that we'd come out of. Yeah, a slight bleakness, but the populace now, would, everybody liked it, but it didn't really filter in whether it... Really? I'm sorry, I have got a real thing about Marlon Brando being the most overrated actor in the world. Yeah, I'm getting it, it <laughs> But the way he couldn't act, and he wasn't that good in it, it actually adds to the part. Did it? Oh, yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so I, 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 yeah. Yeah. It passes the acid test. Really? Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. Well, yeah. 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 I'm going to say something about gothic vocal, just because yeah. I can, because I sing like you, but I don't sing like you at all. Um, <laughs> again, I... Uh, one of the things wow. I really liked about the Violets is that we had a man at the front and a woman at the front. Mm. And um, for any people of the female persuasion in the audience, uh, will know that being a woman in any kind of music scene, um, um, I think it was when I found out that um, I, I, I loved S Club Seven. I thought they were marvellous. <laughs> when I found out that the women who sang in S Club Seven got paid half of what the men got paid, mm. and yeah. it's like. You're surprised. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and there is that thing about it. it's difficult enough being a woman in music anyway, and uh, I'm kind of proud of the fact that I'm not the backing singer. Um, I, I don't know if anyone was at Whitby Gothic Weekend this weekend. Heaven 17 played Blinder of a set. Sorry if that's what they said. They played an extremely good set. And at the end, what's his chops at the front was introducing the band, and he turned to the three women standing next to him and he said, I can't remember their names. <laughs> Luckily, most of the audience went, mm. <laughs> You know what I like about that? You couldn't remember his name. Call <laughs> 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 me old fashioned. Um, well, I, so you and, and again, yeah. I, I suppose one of the things I do when I'm singing, and still do it when I'm singing, is although I do do some floaty stuff, I'm not a floaty, ethereal female god singer because that does seem to be what, certainly from the female vocal side, seems to happen is that you've got the lovely, growly Jim Morrison male singer, but women are just supposed to go, ha ah, ah, ha ah. ha. And then you've got Susie. Thank you. Thank you. you. And it is, uh, and it's like, I, I, that's why I love the Susie as an aesthetic of female vocaling. I think what I was going to say about the goth, the goth or gothic vocal, the thing that, and this leads me to another area, so is, is drama. That a lot of gothic music, a lot of things get called gothic because, you know, something like the birthday party, whether it's gothic or not, Nick Cave is, he hasn't quite developed the crooning the later style of the efforts he did later on and Susie in particular I mean that was a wonderful thing to hear a record like Helter Skelter done the way it should be done mm-hmm. not like a Beatles so later on you know every artist obviously develops changes their voice and not everybody's a dramatic singer um, but I think that was the thing and I think this is sort of my final thing about goth which you may or may not agree with one reason it's had a hard time one reason it gets mocked by people one reason that a style conscious press don't like it is because like anything it gets mocked because anything that puts its heart on its sleeve anything that's open in its allegiances and isn't afraid to say I like this will have the piss taken out of it yeah. whereas anything that's cool and insular anything that doesn't let you in and says you know you can't come in you have to find out the goth has always been do you think that's a fair point? Mm. I, think that's really fair. I, I don't think in England we're comfortable with extrovert culture are we you know it's uh, everybody's a bit out there, like you say, people about, yeah. people about, I mean, when we say extrovert culture, normally we think of people playing the bongos, jumping up and down. That's what we've got. It's I'm talking about emotional, well, taking openness. taking yourself seriously. Is well, even though you probably are saying people are taking themselves that seriously. It's like you get someone like Peter Murphy in Bauhaus. He well, Bella Lugosi is dead. The idea of calling a record Bella Lugosi is dead and being that open and saying, I am so into this, I could <laughs> split down the middle. <laughs> it's just kind of some people would call that naff. I think it's great, but. You agree with that, right? Let's yeah. go back briefly to Nick Cave and Susie. No matter what um, they don't want to be called and what other people choose to call them, they did great vocals for those songs. They were the perfect vocals for the songs they sung. It just, as a one with the music, and um, that's what a good vocal should be. Um, that's what a good record should be a form of expression. Um, I saw that music revolution that was occurring in the late 70s, early 80s, the same as uh, 
Joe Division 2, Ian Curtis's vocals, perfect for the songs, for their music. Um, and that's what it's about. You don't think about, um, well, it's going to be this, so I will approach it this way, because you just go with the flow of the music. You express with the music. That is the first and foremost duty of an artist. Musicians are artists, but it should be. What she used to do, I think, as well, was the emotional openness of goth, which I think is slightly paradoxical, given that goths are seen as kind of a little closed society, sitting on a step, reading a book and smoking a fag. <laughs> so, what, what's, yeah, let's, I mean, let's, we're going to open the floor to questions in a while, but um, talk about the emotion of goth. It is an emotional music, isn't it? Okay, all good music should be emotional. <laughs> all good music isn't But uh, no, this is true, this is true. Um, it's because Gothic is experimental, certainly was at the beginning, and then certain strands of Gothic still are. And so it doesn't want to fit into that box of what it should be. And so therefore it is perceived as being more emotional, more dramatic, because it's not... I'm just going to sing this song about this empty thing, blah, blah, blah. You're singing about something that actually means something to you, mm. whether it is the political post-punk, whether it's about a film that you really like, whether it's a book that you really like, whether it's a thing that you you know, you know, just need to, to sing about, a, an emotion. In every generation of music, uh, whether it's called goth, punk, post-punk, or Emo. surf music, or, or psychedelic music, Whatever, um, it's either it's either the subject is like a painting. It's, it either hits you. It's something that hits you, um, and is born of a true emotion. The difference is with the names of the genres. Um, it's just like okay, take off. The use of dark colours as on a painting, rather than loads of bright pastels or whatever, um, and. That's the only difference. The, the core of the actual music, the emotion, should be the same. The true emotion, or, or otherwise you're painted by numbers. You know? The most general feeling yeah, is it's what it does. That's not good. The darkness, which is more attractive, isn't it? Especially in England, which is just another kind of place, especially in the 70s. Yeah. Now, in terms of like, sort of like that emotional honesty and emotional genuineness, um, I certainly know that's the reason why the Violets reformed and are writing new stuff because, I mean, you know, Cy Denby, he's not here today, but oh my word, he's seriously one of the best lyricists I've ever met, superb lyricist. And um, I was saying earlier, um, you know, we reformed in 2007 to do a reunion gig and, you know, we thought, well, that's fine. But we've got all these songs just bursting out of us because we're still engaged and we're still angry and still kind of pissed off with the loss, and you've got to listen to London's Drowning, really. And, um, and as I was saying earlier to you, John, um, if we were just playing the old songs, which are fun and enjoyable, we'd be kind of like our own tribute band, and so we wouldn't actually still be performing. The only reason the Violets are still performing, and we do still perform the old stuff, because people like it, and then, then yeah, we enjoyed writing them. But the only reason we're still performing is that we're writing new material mm. and using new technology because that's what we were using in the 80s. So, yeah. Right. Um, I am going to open the floor to questions in a minute, but do a bit. Yeah, my final question is the Desert Island Discs. Well, it doesn't have to be a record, but if you found yourself stranded on a Desert Island Disc, apart from a jetpack or a helicopter, or what, or <laughs> what one item relating to this conversation? Would you want with you? Item, like a not piece of music, like a three-dimensional. Well, I'm opening a bit more, so you know you don't have to say uh, Mrs. Mill's greatest example. <laughs> 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 it can be a book, record, film. That's a one hundred sunblock, surely. <laughs> 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 it's a bit more than that. It's a special goth desert island. It's quite bleak. It's not very sunny. Barsley. It's Barsley. Okay, so it's surrounded by water. Right. Barsley. I'll take a supply of pens and something to write on because that's the first thing I want to do. That's good. Yeah. I'm up next. Someone else. <laughs> it's a piece of music as well, yeah? Yeah. Well, okay, right now I will take.
the new 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 Neubarton arms, and it's so amazing, they just wallow in there for weeks. So it's a completely useless thing to take, but it's just such an incredible record. I can list that forever. You probably get rescued quite quickly. I'm <laughs> <laughs> playing loud. Yeah. But a bunch of things that other people shout on. <laughs> 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 I'm sticking with the sunblock. It's not that kind of violence, but Andy, we've got sunblock, pens and paper, and noise open. Are you ready for a great team of party? It's going to be a solar powered high five with some description. Yeah. But they go for it. You'll go for it. Oh, isn't that nice? See, emotional to the core. Yeah, that's too sunny. We go for it. Creativity, passion, imagination. Everything's exercised. That's <laughs> 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 exactly. what would you take? Yet. What would I take? I would take the scream of Susie and the Banshees. Because I love it. Mm-hmm. I don't yeah. Yeah. Then you'd have to take a TV, CD player or something. I would, say, I would say that what's well, no, the iPod. Oh, no, 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 no. Then you have to take everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. you can take a few things, I'll leave. All right, it's the Isle of Wight. <laughs> stranded on the island, there's a lot of people stranded on the island. It's like a race of the land. Have you ever been to Slam? I've never been to Slam, I've been past Slam. Past Slam. I am so past Slam. So I was born. It's changed now. Anyway, but yeah. We've so I'll use that Desert Island thing. We should have put this in the blur of questions that will be answered. What is Slough like? <laughs> Does anybody, and would anybody like to say anything in summing up or any area that you feel hasn't been covered before we turn things over? To Passion you? is the most important ingredient in any form of music, no matter what you want to call it, any form of expression. Does not trouble me either, mean, because it can't have any passion, of course it can. Some of the great records have got no passion in them at all, haven't they? So it's, no, you can't pop great it records, no, no, no. All the great records have passion. I know, some things can be good. Even with stuff down, it's just kind of beautiful. Yeah. Passion. Which is actually quite good. Yeah. Yeah. It's a question. We're going to take some questions. Gentlemen, there, hand up already. That was quick. <coughs> Hi, um, this is for David. Oh, no. You work for the NME, and was was there a kind of actual policy of slagging off goth music? <laughs> <laughs> I think one of the weirdest things was that because we had writers from Leeds, I think there was a slight element of, oh, it was a bit too close to home. People were like, oh no, I don't want that following me down. And I'm not then getting on the train and coming down here. There wasn't, there wasn't a policy. The enemy didn't really have any policies. Places it was hard enough to get into the office in the morning. Um, no, I, I think there was just something about golf, possibly the reasons that I've suggested, that did put people off. And also, it wasn't record company supported. A lot of what we did, I want to agree. Yeah. The thing that I used to first notice about the enemy, like all the music press, was that it, it was an arm of the record industry. And you sort of bit sat over there and it's like, oh yeah, we're smashing the system. Oh, what are you doing? Like, I'm going to this gig, I've got free tickets, and we're going to this launch. We're going to get over free booze, we're all going to wear promotional clothing, and we'll probably get our cab home on expenses. Um, so yeah, and Goth wasn't really, so, Goth, because of its independent background, and it's a circular thing, it's not cool, so it doesn't get supported by the industry, but it's less cool, so it goes underground. And we it becomes really, more cool in its own way, doesn't it? Yeah. It becomes more cool, but you know. It doesn't have to be in the music papers and goth still here and the music press isn't. So <laughs> 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 let's turn that question around. Uh, how, how much do you think you actually need the music press to. Well, I've never read the end of the year, but. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so we're asking the question. I like no it. <laughs> because, uh, so, how would you get your information at the time? Um, uh, probably. Th- Probably mates, I guess. Yeah, word of mouth is already working yeah. then, what it is. It's that period, I mean, the music papers are peaking circulation, but because they're ignoring all these cultures, and it's not just golf, there's at most, like I said at the start, at most, we, we invent all these cultures, because they're engineering them. The people like them, stay in them, so just detach themselves from the, from the mainstream media. And the mainstream media, well, the music media is just dying, isn't it? Which is the pain in the arse when you're working in it, but it's his own fault for ignoring all these kind of cultures, isn't it? I and mean, the impressive at the end is the people involved in these cultures create their own way of moving the information around, which is I'm always been fascinated by as well. So some of these bands you were talking about before, like they, which sold five, six thousand, which obviously not the circulation they need, but it's big enough to get the information around to the community. And the word of mouth your base was working, and the gigs as well. And the bands are always generally quite supportive as well, when the bands would tend to work together, so a big band would bring another band up with it. So 
the bands, and it was all bands now each had their own media in a sense. But that was already happening in that period as well, wasn't it? So the bigger bands are bringing the bands up with them. And that's how the information went out, wasn't it? Yeah. I suppose so we could ask. Yeah. I suppose we could ask. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Actually, well, it's it's like, being in bands, how did how did you survive without the benefits and support of the enemy and melody makers? What the fuck are you just asking? You weren't smashed much. You were a smash hits, actually. That was a quiet week down the hip now. Who were the only ones I never, uh, I don't know. Um, anyway, uh, how did you it? Well, it was all about the music. That's what kept you alive. You know, if you can make money from it, then great. But it was a secondary thing. It was, um, I think for a lot of bands at the time, it was not a, there was no safeguard, you didn't have the backing of a, a label that say to the paper, you will not slag this band off. Because if you do, then we don't advertise yeah. our big multinational bands, you know. I think the reality is and that, that, that a lot of bands didn't survive, not because of the enemy, I hasten to add, but a lot of bands didn't survive because we didn't get any support. And after, uh, you know, and after a while of sort of like managing on the dole, um, it's like it, there's no money left. And, it, and it's like, I mean, it happened to us. I mean, Cy and I left the band for various reasons. And... Um, the band kind of got interest from a record company and it was the absolute death of the band. I left the band, Cy, let's be honest, was kicked out because he was hairy and big. <laughs> and they got in a woman that looked like Kim Wilde. And the Violets had their crack at fame by being in that, what's that film, some kind of wonderful? And um, then disappeared without trace because the lyricist had disappeared. And he actually had to be cool as well. And it, it's yeah. fantastic, and yeah. it's just like when you take the heart out of a band and insert Kim Wilder like, bands don't survive. Yeah. And so a lot of the bands just didn't survive for various reasons, you know, it's like, it gets kind of hungry. Well, one thing I think we should mention, which is not a part of this, but the fact that what an interesting thing about scene is, it's, a, it's, a, it's not just a bloke scene, it's not like you go to... Mm. And the interesting thing people always get about indie gigs, and you say, oh, it's great, you know, go to an indie gig, and it's all mixed, but I actually go to an indie gig, it's about 80% male, when I think yeah. goth scene's 50-50, and it's, it's probably more, if you go to a goth gig, there's probably more women than any other gig of any other type of music you go to, but it's just not, there's not very, you're on a rare case, there's not many female forms, there's a, obviously Susie's very dominating the scene, yeah, but the percentage is smaller than... Than the people yeah. gigs, isn't it? Yeah. But why would that be, Alice? Um, I think it's called sexism. Right. I'll have to check on that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sexism from what? From the audience or from the musician? I think so just the world. sexism. Yeah. Yeah. We'll talk later. Yeah. I'll, I'll yeah. give you a moment. Yeah. I think there are a lot of female. Well, not enough. I would look at the sexism in, in your church music thing. I would definitely do that. Yeah, mm -hmm. definitely. Yeah. 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 No, that can't be having uh, this excuse. Definitely not. Um, I have no yeah, many mm. I've never experienced or seen that from bands like you. Um, mm. that actually was, was, was definitely more nice, you know, mm. which was great. As it should be. Can we have another question? Next question. Oh, no. Yes, you sir. Hello. Hello. Hi, um, I've been older than almost anybody here. I, I was a kid in the 60s and grew up wanting goth to happen. Uh, I never actually came on what it did. So I'd sort of seek out, uh, you know, I'd watch uh, The Adams Family and uh, things like that, and uh, read famous monsters of film land. But um, I'd seek out uh, macabre sort of different elements in the pop and rock that was around at the time. But, so, um, the Doors were mentioned, um, H.P. Lovecraft, the band, uh, some elements of the Rolling Stones in the late 60s. Mm -hmm. um, and I was interested in um, what th your view is on the, those elements that came to form Goth. You know, it didn't arrive fully formed, did it? Mm -hmm. um, so I'm just wondering what your influence What were you listening to before uh, the Big Bang with Susie and the Banshees? Mm -hmm. I think Scoogies are in there as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. It's always been, like you say, it's always been a lot of dark strands of music, but I think we talk about specifically the type of goth we talk about here, which is kind of where 
put a web in this room is kind of reaching back into it. It comes out the pump and the pump's, pumps a spark a bit with an added darkness which and a melancholy kind of moved into it as well. Mm. Which is probably there anyway, because that's I think for his, the UK is a melancholy place, especially in the late seventies when but the country is a broken country. Mm. And the weather's so crap, you know, it's like nine months a year, it's grey, isn't it? And how else do you not get that, that seep into you? But there's a beauty in it as well, you know when you get to like LA, the board is sunny all the time. I asked the panel, what were you listening to before you became... Glam Rock as well, Glam Rock really important. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Bat Bowie, Bowen, that's really key yeah. to it. Yeah. As well as all of that, um, we were talking about this backstage and... Um, backstage? Blank. <laughs> 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 no, I can't. <laughs> and and um, Frank Zappa and Captain Beefheart and a lot of mm-hmm. it. Yeah, because we were... Sort of like disagreeing on the drugs we took when we didn't <laughs> take We took very, well, we took the same drugs, but you wouldn't listen to Captain Big. I'm trying to, but I find Trap Must Rap because it's very difficult because this is a magic mushroom. It's one of the favourite records. <laughs> it's hard to get ahead of us and not. It took about it it an hour to get the record off the record player. I mean, magic mushroom is very difficult to do. That's why you've got the repeat arm. I don't know, it's a knot because it's a bit of a to knot. It's a beautiful record. Yeah. I'll answer your question. For me personally, it was, uh, I grew up with Edith Piaf, yeah. Johnny Cash, in my mother's record collection. Uh, my own personal discovery that changed my life was uh, hearing Ride Away Swan by T-Rex mm. on the radio. Yeah. What a record. And yeah. that was it. Mm. Driving light was, was really yeah. true. And um, then they found Roxy Sex Pistols. <laughs> uh, yeah. It's interesting yeah. because T Rex is it's not dark music, but it just fits so perfectly into it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you can't tell all the puns, is it? Found T Rex. Yeah, so it's yeah, the theatricality yeah. of the, the brilliant lyrics. Yeah. 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 My mum was a huge T Rex fan, so that was what I was going to talk on. This was like revolutionary uh, music, you know, for, for us, you know, because. As children, it's like uh, this changed the whole world, you know, of music. I'm a big fan of the weird cover version. One thing that's very interesting is that after punk, the records that were being covered, and Bowie couldn't be covered because it was a bit too hard to do, but the amount of T Rex covers in the way that Bowie Bauhaus did a telegraph sound, Susan Banshee did, and the 20th century board. Cold Cats did one too, didn't they? I don't think they joined the world of Dorothy's They did, uh, ah. Oh. No, the past is not good as well, but they did the Jeepster podcast, I know they did the T-Rex one, I'm sure they did. Some did the Jeepster. I know they made the Rex one. So Glam Rock's in for Rex Rock. Rex Rock. But there's yeah. interesting what Glam Rock weren't covered, very few. The damn did ballroom blitz. <laughs> 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 I don't care. Um, <laughs> it's not a sweet with great band for the singles. Five singles. Great band, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So I'm glad we're not not supported because of the theatricality, I guess, and great records. And the tribal drums as well, which has been there. The great unspoken, <laughs> very good as well. The double drama thing, very important, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Speaking with David Jay about um, when he was writing about the Gates of Death, um, that apparently the original bass line was taken from Gary Gibbs' rock and roll. Was it? <laughs> what the hell? That's that's what a cool fact. Yeah. Yeah. Do you remember the nice thing about that? They wrote it four yeah. weeks before the recording. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. They don't just start the he, he was, he was, um, that, but he was uh, coming home from work and he'd seen um, Belagosi on TV the night before and one of the horror movies on Dracula's and pedaling home from work. Ooh, lyric popped into head, stopped, pulled out some sticky labels that he had to have in his pocket, wrote a bit, carried on pedaling, stopped, wrote another bit, and by the time he came home, had this whole sheet full of sticky labels with the entire lyrics of Belagosi's dead to his band practice the next day. It's a good fantastically Yeah, yeah. That's great story. Right, I'm song. Can we have another question, please? Yes, gentlemen, I have. What's one? Well, it's all in the back of the house. The door closed. Hello. Um, <laughs> I was wondering what your take is on up and coming bands nowadays in terms of the, the life support mechanisms. For example, when you guys were when, when you guys were starting up, there was things like benefits and university culture was seems to be quite important for bands. There's a current attitude now of you know work until you drop dead. Um, does that do you think that has an effect or a negative or a positive effect even on 
people trying to start up new bands and do something now? And how does that relate to the past? What way do you think it takes it easier or more difficult now? Well, I'm kind of after your opinion on that, really. Right, okay, so oh, yeah, I just wonder what the question was. So, I think, in a sense, the internet makes a massive difference. It, it does create a space where, where people, when I was moaning about what they used to do 30 years ago, that doesn't matter now. So, when the style music you're trying to make, there, there is an established kind of network of forums, message boards, social networking where you can get the message out there. It's not going to make you really there. But at least you can get heard. At least you don't have to go to, to the music press or the radio like you did 30 years ago and get ignored. So you, are, you are your own media now, so that helps. There's, there's, there's certain websites you can probably go to and get written about as well. That's going to help as well. So you get the word out there to start off with. So, and get yourself heard and get yourself seen without anybody changing, without anybody writing it in a different way from what you're trying to try and make artistically in the first place. So I think in a sense, it's slightly easier. What's been interesting the last five years is that bands that people perceive to be lost cause bands for years have actually got bigger. Uh, New Model Army is an interesting example. We're not technically a goth band, but a band that a lot of people on that scene like. And came out of that scene, very important that scene way, because that was the house that all those people used to hang around in Bradford. But they just had a top 30 album in Germany and UK for the first time for about 25 years. And I think that's down to, I mean, they've got a very good forum, a very well organised fan base, got the message out. And I've rediscovered old fans who probably lapsed 10 years ago and dragged them back in again. And that's all the I think. So in a sense, these are good times for underground music. And what people call mainstream music isn't really mainstream music. So the stuff that gets played on the radio now, on how can imagine the terms, a lot of those bands can't even start, they follow them, the follows 3000. But by that Ramstein, another band, kind of darkish, kind of dark sense of humour, kind of ish, ish, gothic in a sense, bands, they can sell out the arena match as 18,000 people on no radio play and no mainstream music press. That's got to be down to something, the information's moving around in different ways, isn't it? Internet, it's got to be, isn't it? And for new bands starting out, it's cheaper to buy recording equipment. The technology is cheaper, it's improved, it's become smaller. It's just a lot easier. You don't have to look for a label um, to uh, paint a studio for you to make your first single or album, etc. And also, the bands need to go into a studio, they can't make it in their own studio, you know, then they can do the crowdfunding in Yagoma, they can do crowd catching, you know, again, the so the internet. So, some things, nature always finds a way forward. Some things become more difficult, for the sign, you know, attitudes, whatever, but other things open up. It's always a balance, you know, and always go forward. I, I wonder how many of the great golf albums were, were funded through, um, you know, um, doll benefit payouts and that kind of thing, whereas <laughs> now... <laughs> That was, that was a great thing at that time, wasn't it? It was the, the unofficial musician's wage, wasn't it? Yeah. The dog government was the best record company. They were paying the wages of thousands of musicians. Yeah. Yeah. You had the time yeah. to be able to you know, write your so, music, yeah. whereas now I think... You know, so I wouldn't want to be too, like, oh yes, it's fabulous. And well, you I think that, that I think that, um, I, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, um, the reality is it's sometimes just really difficult to get people out of the house and come to a gig for whatever reason. It's like we all know gigs where we go and it's a band that we really, really love and 30 people have turned up. So although there are really, really positive things to happen, I think sometimes yeah. being too... So in a sense, everybody's on the internet reading about your band on the same night that you're playing. <laughs> <laughs> it's like also that kind of sense of um, entitlement, that like, well, why should I buy your download? Because I can get it free off YouTube. <laughs> and it's some of that, the reality is that people do expect everything for free. That, that's a terrible generalisation. But there is this sense of entitlement that I can get this free. The more people don't want you to play because they've heard stuff, I think. Yeah. yeah. I mean, when you, I saw you play Manchester a few months ago, whatever it was, and it was a really good turnout for wet Monday nights, you know. And I, think we, and I think one of the things that the Violets have got going for them is that we've got our um, back catalogue and that we've got that kind of, oh God, you guys were around when it started, mm -hmm. kind of classic. Kind of, that yeah. kind of classic thing. And I do think that's one of the things that helps us get, well, not bums on seats, but new rocks on the floor. Um, also, you do well as well, which, you know, it's a good gig, it wasn't like coasting representation. Because we do want to make the gigs like an event rather than just turn up, play, 
back up to the bar. Yeah. Oh, that was when you said bats cat and what we were um, <laughs> right. We said back, which means that we must almost end the event. That's the closing word of the evening. Um, we've got time, gentlemen, in the other half there for well, one. This better be a quick question. Uh, yeah, for John. Um, mentioned you were considering writing a book earlier about the goth music scene. If the definitive book hasn't been written, where would you send people to look for basically on the bookshelves? Right, well, what I've read about this last book, I think that, that's, that's going to be a really good book. I think Mick Mercer's books, even though they're not, uh, they're not that in depth, but they're just a fantastic list of things of information, those are really good websites as well. I, I, I don't think there's to be a super definitive book right back in the musical kind of sense, so maybe that's a little gap, because yours covers more for kind of cultural things, don't it? Well, I mean, yeah. two, the World Wide yeah. that was about the worldwide scene, the art of Gothic, which is yeah. the one that's just come out, is about um, album cover art and yeah. film cover art. So, so I, I was kind of going to do, you know, what well, I was thinking about, I've already really done bits of it so far, but I think of the way, when, when John Savage is in his dreaming book, it made people think about punk in a completely different way, because up to that point, people thought punk was a bit of a stupid culture. And, and I'll talk about people outside the culture, but he made them take it seriously as something that's actually artistically, musically, really be good. Now, if I can get the book right, I'm not saying I can because I might be too stupid to do it, but I might get, it, I might get this kind of music taken seriously like that. And it did annoy me the way that Simon Rowe's book, which is a fantastic book about a post punk thing, but missed out for me what was half the music at that time. So I'm trying to get that music to get that. Try to explain to people outside this room how good this stuff was, you know, and how bad is that Bauhaus? Incredibly revolutionary musically, you know. They're not, they're not just this band that music papers hated, and that's all they're kind of known for outside the so-called goth scene. But they made revolutionary music, which sounds incredible. It came out of the vacuum. You think, wow, well, you know, you know, John Peel played it because he understood how good they were, and when he was playing, you, could, you knew he got that as well. It's, this band, that, within six weeks of it, these incredible songs of a whole new sound. I like the early Southern Death Court, and those bands, and Dirt Wears White Socks, which is an incredible record, you know. Yeah. And I want those records to get taken seriously by people, not in a, not in a pole face way, but people say, these should be, you know, the line is classic music in the UK. You see, you know, it goes this, people still did it, but there's a gap. But where this stuff should be, you know, I want to get this stuff put back in the language in a sense, you know, what it should be. And then the next time I make a programme on Gotham BBC, don't put Shakespeare's sister in it, because, <laughs> because, because they'll understand what it actually probably really was. But also, why is in the premises of it? Because there's a lot of industrial music which kind of fits into it as well, you know, I think that's important. You know, and, and stuff, um, yes, yeah, so, so, so it's not just, you know, people always say it's the five bands, and that's it. So it's kind of interesting writing about a thing that's not really seen when other bands say the goth bands. So you can't lump people together, then unlumping them straight away. So it'd be like that. It's, it's ambitious. It's a, it's a stupid task, really. Yeah. <laughs> Can I just break back in? So, not just people outside this room, but I think a lot of people already in the scene really appreciate having that from somebody like yourself. Yeah, they, they'd they'd to, I'd imagine on message boards everywhere, they'd be slagging off saying, who do you think he is saying it's this and that? But that's cool. <laughs> I mean, one of the things is, it's, it's, one of the greatest things is getting slapped off by everybody as well. That's quite good fun. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, um, I'd like to thank Andy, Rosie, Natasha, and John, and you for coming. Thank you very much.